the 2007 Emperor <coughs> Has No Clothes Award, Christopher Hitchens Freedom from Religion Foundation. We'll just set it right here. Thank you. Very Thank good. you. Thank great. you. Thanks. Well, thank you. For, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, and friends, brothers, sisters, for coming. Thank you for a very generous introduction. Thank you for the calendar. Um, my birthday is the 13th of April, which is the same birthday as the author of the uh, Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, uh, Mr. Jefferson. I took my oath at his memorial in Washington, swearing to, particularly, I wrote it in, uphold the uh, separation of church from state, as bodied forth in his letter as president to the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, who were frightened of persecution. Frightened of persecution from whom, by the way? The Congregationalists of Danbury, Connecticut. Um, anyway, in the, in, as you, the world knows, though it doesn't know that, uh, the reply that he gave said that there shall ever be a wall of separation between church and state in this great republic, and I proudly affirmed as much, and I have been going around the South <clears throat> promulgating my new slogan in which I ask you to join me. Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. <clears throat> That's an accidental preface given me by our, our, our generous host. I didn't realize I was going to be able to say that, and I I uh, did feel I might give you a brief report on the campaign trail, on the swing through uh, the areas of piety. Um, I don't ever claim to feel or detect the finger of the divine, certainly not in my own arrangements. But I guess it was lucky that in the first week, as I was in North Carolina, the carcass of Jerry Fuller was found unraptured. <clears throat> slumped on the floor of his, the mediocre degree mill of an office in, in uh, Virginia. And I was able to say, though, they tried to bleep it on, I think it was Hannity and Combs, um, and I was terrified for a minute that Dan was going to tell this for me, but um, that had he been given an enema, he could have been buried in a matchbox. <clears throat> So good are things these days with YouTube and other things my children can do and I cannot that apparently I was lip-read saying that even though they bleeped it out. So it got said on the air anyway. So let's, let's not say that all the victories are to the wicked side. But I didn't expect that by the end of the summer there would have been a bunch of letters published by the late woman arrogantly calling herself Mother Teresa. Agnes Bojashu, elderly virgin of Macedonia, inflicting her hideous doctrines on the wretched of Bengal, uh, saying that uh, she couldn't believe a word of it either. I, mean, <clears throat> I didn't think she was one of us too, and look, let's be charitable. Let's welcome the old bag before it's too late. <laughs> um, if she can't bring herself to believe it, and if all her confessors can do is to say that the suffering that results gives her a share in crucifixion, then let's for heaven's sake extend the hand of compassion uh, to her ourselves. Now, what, here's what I've learned on this uh, process of debate and engagement with the faithful, where I don't want to sound conceited, but I have now taken on all the comers they suggest. I don't nominate their side. I don't nominate their team. And no one yet has said that I've lost one. It's the furthest I ought to go in, in the fairness. But um, here's what I've learned. I've learned not to say some things that w used to irritate me. I don't say, for example, why do they never come up with any new arguments? As I heard myself saying after a debate with a theologian the other night in Georgetown, well, they can't come up with any new arguments, can they? They're stuck, if you like, with the old arguments. They can say, if you like, and by t torturing themselves into pretzel shape, all right, this, this applies only to those who do accept the theory of evolution by natural selection or who do understand a little bit of physics. They say, come to think of it, it does look as if we got here as primates after 99.8% of all the other species ever created on Earth became extinct. 
that only shows how clever God was to begin with. It's not much of an argument, is it? Actually, it's not, it doesn't really count as an argument at all. It isn't reasoning of any kind. It's a sort of reverse engineering. But it is, as is, is often said of hypocrisy, uh, the compliment that vice pays to virtue. It's a tribute, in a sense, to the work that, had it been done earlier, would have meant there was no need for superstition in the first place. The same with the Big Bang. After all, it's an awesome cosmic event <clears throat> involving a great deal of heat and a great deal of light. In fact, Dinesh D'Souza, one of my best antagonists, a really believing, serious Catholic, does say in his new book, What's So Great About Christianity, a book that needs a question mark in its title but doesn't have one, <laughs> that come to think of it, now we look at it again, Genesis, instead of negating the Big Bang, predicts it because we used to laugh and say, how could God create light and only then the sun, the moon, and the stars? Well, the Big Bang answers that. So you see, it was always there all along, only we were too dumb to see it. Now, I agree with Dinesh that that's a nice try. But that's as generous as I'm prepared to be. No, what we have to do is grasp something right off and stop being in the least bit apologetic about it ourselves. It is often quasi-conceded, if I can put it like that, phrase it like that, that the religion may be metaphysically false and not even really metaphorically true <clears throat> when you think of those tortures about the Big Bang that I've just adumbrated. And its figures are those of legend and myth. And its miracles are fairy tales for scared children and all of this. And that all this is now completely impossible to deny or to refute. But nonetheless, it has an ethical basis. These fairy tales at least teach children how to behave well. The beginning of the argument must be that we say this is not so. Not so. We, are, we are not conceding this to the faithful. Is it moral, for example? to tell children, to tell anybody, that their sins can be forgiven them because of a human sacrifice in which they had no say, in which if they had had any childish say, they would have wanted to stop, wouldn't have wanted to see it happen. That because of the, the, the hideous public torture and, and death of someone 2,000 years ago, that their personal responsibility is dissolved. All they need to do is to recognize the beauty of this human sacrifice, throw their sins on the scapegoat, and be forgiven them. That's a positively immoral doctrine in my submission. I could, if I wanted to, offer to pay your debts. I'm not gonna. But I could, if I liked you enough, I could do that. I could, if I really, really liked you enough, I suppose there's no system that allows it, but I could, there used to be in primitive society, I could offer to serve your term in prison for you, if I knew you and I believed in you. <clears throat> we know of cases, uh, Charles Dickens is, um, Tale of Two Cities is the, is the most luminous, where someone will even take someone else's place on the scaffold. They'll, they'll do their suffering for them. They'll pay their debts. But they can't take away their responsibility. They can't say those sins never occurred. And it would be immoral to try. So at the very centerpiece of the main religion, at any rate in these United States, there is something that is positively wicked. We are not arguing. We, it's insulting for us to be made to argue that we might be less ethical or moral because we don't believe. It's not enough for us to say, hey, you can be a good person and be an atheist. Somebody at the convention of AAI the other day in Washington was quoted on television just before my, I was interviewed, that's why I saw it, saying, well, we're good people, we're just not God people. No, no, nice try. Get off the apologetic, get off the defensive. You can't be a good person and a God person. You can't be. Religion is the inculcation by coercion, not just of irrationality, but of immorality. What is moral about vicarious redemption, the horrible doctrine I just mentioned? What is moral about the, the mutilation of the genitals of children in the name of God? What is moral about that? The genital mutilation community is entirely theocratic. It should accept responsibility for what it advocates and not say it's teaching morality. What about the Muslim injunction that anyone wishing to change their religion to become an apostate must be killed? Is it moral teaching to say that people who have second thoughts about people who have second thoughts about faith must suffer the death penalty? I hardly think so. Is it moral for Orthodox Jews to greet every lovely day with thanking their maker? 
for not making them a woman or a Gentile, a goy? Is it moral for the women to have to say that we thank God for making us the way we are? Actually, that's not at least immoral, but there's something somewhat fatuous about it. I hope you'll agree. It's a form of sadomasochism, which, despite some of its advocates, I don't think is good for you in the long run. You're told, to begin with, <clears throat> that you are a worm, a sinful, guilty, shrunken, miserable creature who, who has, as we used to be made to say in Anglican school, no health in us. The Quran says, made of a clot of blood. The Bible says, dust. The Jews say, thank God, at least you're not a goy. You begin with this abject masochism. Uh, you're told that you're responsible for sins that were uh, committed before you were born that you couldn't have influenced that your only chance is to take part in a barbaric ritual of torture and death if you were to be free of this inherited burden. It's almost worse than race theory. But just because no one can be that abject for so long or forever, there's a compensating offer. Well, the universe is designed with you in mind. And God has a plan for you. So from being a groveling worm and clump of blood clot or dust, you can go straight to saying, well, there's a divine scheme and it has me in mind. To the most arrant, the most solipsistic uh, self-centeredness and arrogance, this is not morality. This is bound to lead to bad behavior, psychically, physically, socially. And it always has, and it always will. Is wish thinking moral? <clears throat> I don't think it's moral at all to lie to children. When I meet people in holy orders and I'm, I feel I'm meeting someone who is paid to lie to children. I don't think that's a moral calling or occupation. To tell children that they should be terrified of hell or that they, if they do a right action or if they avoid wrong actions as defined as inescapable, they might go to heaven. This is wicked. It's ruined the childhoods of millions of children down the generations. We have some but not all of their memoirs. There's certainly nobody in this room who doesn't know somebody whose life was effectively wrecked by this. And it has something else that's not moral or defensible, which is an implicit appeal to the totalitarian. The origins of totalitarianism, our greatest enemy, lie in this. We're told that we wouldn't know a right from a wrong action. We wouldn't be able to tell, let alone to perform one, if we were not already the property of a celestial dictator who we must love and fear at the same time. Compulsory love is a pretty horrible idea. The fear that goes with it is a little more than the negation of that. Let me give you an instance of what I mean. I've been to all three of the axis of evil countries now. I'm the only writer who has. When I was a child and I was told about heaven and hell, I couldn't form a picture of heaven <coughs> because I was told, well, what it would be was eternal praise everlasting praise and thanks all the time thanks and praise and thank you and I'll praise you again forever for doing what appears to come to you naturally and having made me out of a clot of blood sounded like hell to me <laughs> um, of hell of course a child can be given an awful picture and many, many children never get over it but I, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to live like that forever praising well now I've been to North Korea and I do know the only, duty, the only duty or right of the half-starved citizen is to thank for his handful of dirty rice every day, or hers, the dear leader who makes it possible. There is no other culture. All films, all plays, all classes in school, all programs on the TV and the radio, they're all about the same thing. You have to thank the dear leader. Would that that were enough? Uh, the dear leader is only the head of the party and the army in North Korea. He's not the president of North Korea. The president is his father, who's been dead for 15 years. Did you know that? Well, North Korea has a dead president. It's a necrocracy. <laughs> a thanatocracy. <clears throat> a mausolocracy. It's a death cult. And you may have noticed it's only one short of a trinity. And the son is the reincarnation of this father. And now I know what it would be like. Now I know what it would be like. And I wasn't able in the article I wrote to begin to describe the horrific pointlessness and misery of what it would be like to be a North Korean even for half a day. None of, you, none of you can imagine it, but it's what theocracy wants you to imagine and be grateful for. 
And I'll add this. <clears throat> At least you can fucking die and get out of North Korea. <laughs> it is the only way you can leave that hermetic nightmare. Not so with monotheism. When you die is when the totalitarianism really begins. Now, who wants this to be true? Who but someone servile and stupid and pathetic wants it to be true that they can be convicted of thought crime at any minute of their day or night as they're sleeping for thinking the wrong thing? Who wants to be always in debt to someone who never asked them if they wanted the loan in the first place? Who wants this? All of, all of us who, as Americans, oppose the very idea of unfreedom and tyranny must say that this is where the resistance to totalitarianism, excuse me, to totalitarianism really begins by the repudiation of religion and by the defiance of theocracy. And that's where the battle for our values has to start. So, religion abolishes our obligation to live in truth, very important part of our basic integrity. It caters to our worst solipsism and our worst masochism uh, simultaneously, thus denies us our self-respect. On the uh, trail, so to say, I've evolved um, three challenges. Well, two, really. One takes a dual form, if you'll allow the expression. Uh, on this matter of ethics and morality, I say to every cleric I've debated with, and to all of their audiences, and I've said it on the Christianity Today website now, on countless TV and radio shows, in print hundreds of times, on public platforms dozens of times, and I've not yet had an answer. If you say that morality can only be derived from a supernatural authority, dictatorship, don't have to say that, just say authority, then you must be able to name for me an ethical statement made or an ethical action performed by a believer that could not have been performed by a non-believer, by an infidel that would be forbidden to them, un unavailable, unaccessible to them. Can you do it? They haven't yet. The challenge has been out extant for really quite a long time. Whereas, if I can just mention my corollary, if I ask any audience, not just this one, any audience, I did it in Georgetown University, the headquarters of the, the, well, the, headquarters of the Catholic faith in this country the night before last, ask anyone in any audience to say, can they think of a wicked action performed that could only have been performed in the name of God or under divine instruction, no one has any hesitation in recognizing or identifying one. Now, as long as this remains the case, it is they who have to do the explaining, they who owe the accounting, they who owe the apology, and not us, and we must be plain on it. I have a third challenge, which is to those who say the president is one of them, uh, that in these matters that can't yet quite be decided of where we come from, our cosmos, our species, um, we should teach the argument. We should have equal time. The president is too stupid to know that there isn't really an argument about this uh, anymore. <clears throat> there used to be one. And when there was, when people weren't quite certain, the line of the churches was that the teaching of evolution and of Darwinism should be banned altogether. They didn't want equal time then. Notice the slippage of their gears. When they were strong enough to try and ban it, that's what they wanted to do. Now they're not strong enough, they come up with a, a weedy, feeble, uh, ingratiating whine of, well, equal time, fair dues, open-mindedness, and so on, as if there really was a disagreement about this. All right, let's see if we can accommodate them. I learned about Darwin by studying, actually, the debate between Bishop Huxley and, um, excuse me, Bishop Wilberforce and Thomas Huxley at Oxford. That's that a classic debate. That's how I learned about it. I wasn't taught it in science class. I was taught it in history class. That's how I learned. I've learned since, as you have, about the debate between uh, Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, the idol of all morondom. Uh, Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, the idol of all morondom, as H.L. Uh, Mencken called him in Dayton, Tennessee. I learned about that in history and literature class, not in biology class. Keep it out of there, because otherwise we'll be having people saying, well, children, chemistry period is over, but we'll be doing alchemy in the next half. <laughs> I put away your astronomy books and get out your astrology charts, because we are open-minded in this school. 
and other stultifying nonsense that you wouldn't even get in a madrasa, I should think. Uh, but if we're to accept the principle, then let us say to the president and his friends, by all means, equal time. Any church that is tax exempt, therefore, any religious group that gets a break from the, the IRS, any church that's in receipt of any monies at all from the so-called faith-based initiative must give 50% of its time to the teaching of evolution by natural selection. <clears throat> You might take that back to your communities and tell them to suck on that and see if they like it. Because um, <clears throat> that's what they seem to be asking but are too stupid to realize. You see, off the defensive again, we're not resisting them. We're on their trail now. We've got their number. We're on their track. They're the ones who should be scared of us. Don't you think it's about time? I do. Now, because religion was the... Uh, someone will tell me when I'm trespassing on our time together, won't they? Will you, Annie Laurie? Will you let me know? I mean, my impression is that people come to events like this, especially people like you, for the chance to speak as well as to listen. And um, we are to, supposed to have some time. It's yours. Shall I just bang on till they tell me to stop? Okay. Um, but I wouldn't mind a, a light of some... So I, I, don't, I don't want to skip our Q&A... Q&A sounds patronizing, the time which belongs to us, okay? And then I will stop being this nice and I'll only talk to someone who has a receipt. <laughs> Preferably from an independent bookstore. Because um, this is America after all and I didn't sign up for nothing. Um, okay. The first and the... I have another challenge. This is my fourth one. Um, the, we, we have religion in our midst and it's in our, even in our minds, we know where it comes from. For an excellent reason. Religion is the first and therefore, in some ways, therefore the worst of our attempts to explain human nature and the natural order. It was our first attempt at philosophy, just as it was our first attempt at astronomy and at biology. We embarked on it in a time of fearful infancy when we didn't know that we lived on a rounded planet in a tiny solar system which had a center around which we revolved. It didn't revolve around us. Religion used to preach the contrary. We didn't know that there were microorganisms that we couldn't see but that explained a lot about both our health and our unhealth, ill health. We were told we were given dominions over all animals and we were wrong because there were no dinosaurs in that list, no marsupials because the people who wrote this didn't know they existed. And we were certainly never given dominion over microorganisms, and we'll never get that, uh, because they rule. Um, good for the gut, sometimes bad for other things. Uh, permanently, uh, almost, uh, sort of, as it were, highly evolved rivals. We were baffled by climatic and cataclysmic events. Earthquakes, tidal waves, uh, storms, lightning, all of this was to us terrifying. Okay, religion worked as an attempt, then, to make sense of things. We are pattern-seeking mammals, after all. It's a good thing that we are, because if we weren't pattern-seeking mammals, our curiosity would have no outlet, and we wouldn't be capable of the great innovations that have liberated us from so many things, including religion. <clears throat> and it's argued by some, well, then, give it some credit. Um, the, the late Stephen Jay Gould said... Let's consider religion in one corner and the study of science and reason in another and consider them non-overlapping magisteria. They, one does one, one does the other. There's no need for a conflict. Uh, I think this has become, especially with the extraordinary revolution that we've been through in the last 20 years or so in the human and natural sciences with the work of Richard Dawkins, Stephen Weinberg, uh, Daniel Dennett, Carl Sagan. I hope I'm not leaving anyone out. I'm, I'm sure I am. Um, uh, Stephen Hawking, of course, many others, that we've come to the point where we have to say, no, this stuff is incompatible with, in fact, I prefer to say irreconcilable with, uh, reasoned acquisition of knowledge and reasoned deployment of it. <clears throat> and I think I've found a way, I'm a non-scientist, who's profited a lot from studying this discussion, 
of putting it to a lay audience in such a way as it can be clearly understood. And if you like, I'll share it with you. Would you like me to share? Sharing is such a lovely word, isn't it? Um, well, it's this. I've taken the best evidence that I can, most recently, the night before last, in Georgetown, from Francis Collins, who, as you know, completed the Human Genome Project, but who believes himself to be the object of a divine design. I was very impressed once when hiking to find a frozen waterfall that went into three parts, a trinity, and knelt down at that very moment and uh, gave himself, he says to Jesus, though I don't see what Jesus has to do with the free freezing of the waterfalls, but it could have been Muhammad, it could have been Krishna, he chose the Nazarene, and who therefore demonstrates that for many people it is possible to hold apparently irreconcilable ideas in the head at the same time and who is a man I was very proud to have met, honored to have even been discussing with. Very well, I asked him, <clears throat> how long, doctor, do you believe the human species, Homo sapiens, after our brief encounters with the Cro-Magnons and the Neanderthals and so on, have been autonomous as Homo sapiens on the Earth? He said, I've heard from Carl Sagan and Richard Dawkins, maybe it's as long as 200, maybe 240 or 50,000 years, or as low as... And he said, as low as 100,000. It could only be 100,000. I said, OK. I'm Jewish on my mother's side. I'll take 100. <laughs> 100,000 years then. Let's just, that's all I need for this experiment. 100,000 years, ladies and gentlemen, of our species. Born. Probably dying a lot. Well, evidently dying a lot in childbirth and killing its mothers by doing so but managing to get born. Living life expectancy for the first 50,000 years is probably not more than about 20, 25. Dying of microorganisms we didn't know were there. Dying of our teeth, which was suspiciously too near our brain for when they, when they rotted or became infected. Um, terrified by earthquakes, lightning, floods, famines, inexplicable cataclysmic events. Uh, fighting one another for sex, for food for shelter, for territory, all of that. You can, any of you can fill in this bit for yourself, this trope. Have a rough picture of what it was like, but, but j slow it's true, and gradual and much backsliding, but a sort of upward progression to where we are approximately now. Four, 50, 60, 70, 80, add on. Think, think of the wars now, think of the famines, think of the rapes. Think of the gods they had, think of the bears they worshipped and made skulls, bear skulls they made into totems. Think of the waterfalls they thought were magic. Think of the rocks they thought were special. Think of all this. They weren't without God. Believe you me, none of them were. But that didn't count. It didn't count at all. Because uh, heaven watched this. Like that. All that suffering, death, disease, murder, misery, famine, with folded arms and indifference until <clears throat> 98,000 years had gone by and said, now it may be time to intervene. <laughs> and the best place to do it, and the best place to conduct this intervention would not be China, where people can read and make gunpowder. <laughs> but in sort of Bronze Age Palestine would be a good, a good place to implant the idea by human sacrifice. Of course, we always do that. <clears throat> and then see if the news can spread in pure form by word of mouth. Now, I don't know about you, I'm willing, I've debated a lot of religious people now. I know that it's conceivable that in nature there is such a thing as parthenogenesis. Thus, a virgin could conceivably conceive without the, the um, I think, rather explicit preconditions <laughs> that are thought by some to be so possibly conceived without the, the um, I think, rather explicit preconditions <laughs> that are thought by some to be so problematic. Um, why so many gods have been born that way, I don't quite know. I don't think of the birth canal as a one-way street, and I hope neither do you. <laughs> but I could be brought to believe that. I could be. And since resurrection is so commonplace in the New Testament, it happens all the time. If it was commonplace then, it doesn't seem to be commonplace now, but it would mean it wasn't particularly special that there was a resurrection there either. It certainly wouldn't prove the doctrines of the person who was so resurrected. Okay? I, could, but I could be brought to believe that. I can't be brought to believe the story I've just told you, which must be true if religion is true. If religion is true, that's what happened to our species. And that's impossible. 
and it's irreconcilable with what we know. It's incompatible with what we know. It can't be squared with any concept we could possibly form of scientific knowledge or of the development of our cosmos, our biosphere, or our species. So we'd be better off without it, even if it preached morality, which it does not. Okay. Am I moving towards my climax? You may be wondering. <laughs> well, now, I listened to Katha last night, as I always do when I get the chance, and I agree with her that uh, we have some reason to be optimistic, as, at least on the territory of these United States, that our enemies are in retreat. That they're not only beaten in the courts, but they're humiliated in the courts. If you haven't read my friend Matthew Chapman's book on the Dover Pennsylvania case, may I recommend it to you very strongly? I didn't see it on the literature table, but Matthew is uh, Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson. He's a great friend of mine. He's recently decided to become re-involved in this matter. He's basically a filmmaker. He just thought he couldn't, he couldn't stay out of the argument any longer. He went to Dover, Pennsylvania. He sat there for the whole trial, which lasted 40 days and 40 nights, <laughs> which is the title of his book, which I recommend. And it does show how a small town America can throw off this nonsense with some brio, and that's very much to the good, I think. Um, and there are other indications as well of a, of a fight back. However, if we look at the international picture, I find the, pic I find the uh, situation uh, very worrying. It doesn't make me optimistic at all. Um, in Russia recently, uh, mobilized by the extremely cynical forces of Vladimir Putin's party and his security services, the Russian Orthodox Church is back as a real part of the nationalist, autarkic, one-party, Russian chauvinist regime that he wishes to restore after the, the humiliations that were visited on the greater Russian idea uh, in the last few years. At, at, at every point uh, where that regime tries to impose itself, you will find a black draped figure standing next to the KGB man, and in the classroom too. It's coming. And it could be very, very, very dangerous. It's very often ignored. And when President Bush met Putin and saw he was wearing a crucifix, as you may remember, he said that was the obvious and clear proof that the man was a good egg. <laughs> a form of national suicide, it seems to me, that we'd have a president who could be so easily taken in by a sadistic expansionist goon who has a clerical militia as part of his campaign to intimidate Georgia, uh, Poland, Chechnya, the Baltic states, Ukraine, and Beyond this, many others. It's going to be in our future, and theocracy is going to be one of the forms it's going to take, and it's nuclear. So think about that, if you would, for a bit. Um, think about what you, of course, already know, uh, the situation in Iran. Now, in Iran, here's another case where uh, religion doesn't always lead to moral results. Um, in Iran, you're not allowed to execute a female virgin whatever crime she's committed. She might have been a member of an opposition group. She might have blasphemed in some way. She might have uncovered her hair in public. Who knows what she might have done, but you're not allowed, even if the death penalty applies, to put her to death if she's a virgin. So <clears throat> she's raped by the revolutionary guards in the prison, and then she can be executed. Some people say that without God, people would give themselves permission to do anything. Look at that case and see that with God, only with God, only with the view that God's on your side, can people give themselves permission to do things that would otherwise be called satanic. That's what this regime is like. I've seen it up close, too. Now, our greatest nightmare is about to occur, because even at its worst, I think Mr. Putin's regime is a cynical and, so to say, materialist one. We're about to see in Iran uh, the coincidence we've dreaded for a long time that of a messianic regime with apocalyptic weaponry. And it's evidently looking for a confrontation with secular society everywhere, from Lebanon uh, to Iraq. It, doesn't, it, it feels it can fight and win because it feels that a tooth fairy called the Twelfth Imam, its messiah, is, uh, is about to return to them. Um, and this is a fantastically dangerous, an extraordinarily dangerous uh, state of affairs. To see what the parties of God have been doing to demolish Iraqi civil society is something you can see every day. You don't need me to tell you about. To see the Messianic settlers on the West Bank <clears throat> trying to bring on the Messiah in their way 
and hope, to, and hope to bring about the end of days, is another phenomenon that has become to us almost too familiar. Remember again part of our charge against religion, part of our belief that it is fundamentally wicked and anti-human, is precisely its eschatology. Religion is predicated on the idea that our time here is short and should be shorter, that our job is to bring on the end of days, that this is just a veil of tears and guilt and shame and excrement. This, the only life we have, the only life that we have that contains music and art and literature and solidarity and sex all of, and love, all of this should be swept away. We can't wait for the end times to come. That's what they all have to believe. The Archbishop of Canterbury, of all people, the man who's thought to be the head of the mildest church of the lot, a few years ago, Geoffrey Fisher was his name. These are the people who say that they lead a flock and who certainly look like sheep. Um, and how much can you tell, by the way, from a religion that refers to its adherents as if they were sheep and its leaders as shepherds? But never mind that for now. Geoffrey Fisher it was who said, discussing thermonuclear war, you would have thought if I'd given you the quote blind that it was some verminous mullah, uh, said the worst it could do would be to usher people sooner and in their millions into a higher form of life to which they're destined anyway. Eschatology is inseparable from religious faith. It wants this to come to an end. It seeks our destruction. It thirsts for it. it and it sometimes plans for it. And that's what's happening to us now. So I am not happy at the way in which these clouds are gathering, uh, not just in the corner of our eye, but increasing directly in our, in our vision. And so rather than just uh, leave you with a pessimistic thought, I want to leave you with, a one, with one that I hope slightly pisses you off. <laughs> um, in the, in Cather's speech at any rate last night, and in the literature table that I saw <clears throat> at the back, and in many of the conversations I've had on the side here, um, I would have got the impression that we were all met here to tell Jerry Falwell to fuck off. <laughs> That's not true at all. It's very, I don't think anyone's done much more than I have to rubbish the Christian coalition, to ridicule them, to oppose them, to trash them in their own heartlands, to denounce them in print and on the air and so on. Uh, it's a necessary job, it's a very important thing to do, but um, it's not the whole story. Um, you haven't really come out, as I'm sorry to hear the expression is, for us this weekend. You haven't declared yourself bravely to be an atheist and, and to, to be defending civilization against clerical barbarism. You haven't done that when, if all you've done is denounce some moon-faced Christian coalitionist or some bum-faced Jesuit child molester. That should be the elementary duty of a citizen, and many non uh, atheists are capable at least of doing that. No, in order to say you've taken on the battle, you have to say that you are taking on jihad. The most virulent, the most dangerous, the most evil, the most pernicious, the most systematic attack that secular civilization is currently facing. And I sense a terrible neutrality about this in this hall and in this constituency. I sense a real reluctance to mention anything that might possibly put people on the same side as the 82nd Airborne or the 101st, or indeed President Bush or Paul Wolfowitz. I sense a real hanging back on the only thing that's going to decide whether our civilization outlasts barbarism or not. And if I'm wrong, I want you to tell me. And if we start an argument, I won't leave till the last dog dies. Thanks. Sure. Um, I'm not finished, but um, I've barely got my trousers off, but uh, <laughs> that's always when they tell me to stop. <clears throat> so who should recognize questioners? Uh, should it be me? I haven't planted anyone here, have I? Is there an open mic? Yes. Yeah, Go for it. I, I'm not sure I share your view. I, I, think, I think the Muslim 
fundamentalism is one of the worst. Maybe it's the worst. Maybe it's worse than all of them. I don't know about that for sure, but I do have my strong belief that by invading Iraq, by kicking out Saddam as, as terrible and brutal a guy as he was, um, we have brought about the growth of this terrible fundamentalism. We've made the Muslim, we've caused the Muslim world to regress. And I don't, I don't, I think that sending in the 82nd Airborne can only push us in a reverse direction. I'm wondering if your views have changed since the war started and um, if you think the war was a good idea or if it's going well. Well, without, um, <clears throat> without having what I'm very willing to have in the time of argument in detail on Iraq, I can tell you immediately how I disagree with you. You give away the entire argument when you say they only get angry because of what we do. That was what was said about September the 11th as well. That's what's said about everything that the United States or the West does. We've made them angry. It's not because of the failed state created by Islamic backwardness that turns into a rogue state because it can't blame itself for its failure and exports the violence. That can't be it. It must be something we've done. That's, you stated the ground of my disagreement with you absolutely perfectly. I won't listen to a bar of that song. The problem is, and I shouldn't have to be saying this to an audience of unbelievers, the problem is the religion to begin with. And the oppression that it promulgates, the violence that it preaches, the way that it denies rights to half of its citizens by <clears throat> virtue of their gender, the dreams of conquest that it inculcates into children, and so forth. No, we can't make that any worse by fighting it. We do not, we do not create jihad by resisting it. We just don't resist it enough. We let Iraq rot for far too long. Far too long. We should have taken care of that a long time ago. And we need to be training an army that is willing to fight in this way, in the, in the most bizarre and ghastly and unpredictable circumstances, as we are doing, an army that's trained to fight and really kill in order to defend us. And if you think that that idea is more dangerous than the idea of an Iranian theocracy waltzing past the European Union, spitting its way through the United Nations, tearing up all the treaties it's ever signed as it goes, laughing at us, sending death squads to kill our novelists, sending death squads to blow up the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires, sending killers with impunity to Berlin to kill the Kurdish democratic leadership of Iran in a restaurant in Germany, doing all this and never suffering a thing and then about to become thermonuclear. If you don't think that's the most dangerous thing, then you have no concept of what a threat religion can really be. And you don't see it when it's glaring you in the face. So don't clap, I don't care. Uh, I have recollections of uh, growing up, uh, being schooled uh, as a youngster in Catholicism, and I remember having uh, doubts about God, and and then I remember reading history books, uh, you know, describing kings and, and their activity, and I thought one equated with the other. God sort of was a um, recreated with the idea of kings. And now I, I feel with what's going on in this country in terms of uh, the administration uh, trying to create and make imperial the unitary executive, uh, I feel that that also equates with the king and with God and that we should be resisting as much as we can, and for that reason, th that is the reason I think we should impeach Cheney and Bush for doing that, and as, as a sidebar, I would say, ideally, we prob probably should impeach Congress as well for, for their accommodation. While we're at it. Well, I'm tempted to take that as a comment, but um, I'll simply add, uh, I remember John Ashcroft, Bush's first Attorney General, saying, um, making the statement, in the United States, we have no king but Jesus. A statement that is exactly two words too long. 
um, and is in need of a, an abrupt circumcision uh, to cut it down to size, uh, cut itself down to size. I'm a, as if, if you care, I'm a named plaintiff in the lawsuit brought by the American Civil Liberties Union against the National Security Agency and the Justice Department on the warrantless wiretapping. We, we won the first round in a court in uh, Michigan. And we, um, but no, it, I, I have to I, I just, uh, I knew if you ever clapped, you'd be at the wrong moment. Um, when I, I write for, uh, for um, Free Inquiry magazine, I wrote the column that some of you probably see, and uh, it depresses me that the impression given by that magazine most of the time is that in order to read it, you should be a liberal Democrat. I think that's a dangerous and foolish thing to be doing. There are a lot of people uh, who are not Democrats and not liberals who perfectly understand the separation between church and state. There are a lot of right-wing atheists, some of them, I'm afraid to say, fans of the unreadable novels of Ayn Rand and so forth. But it's, <laughs> this, this is not, this, I wouldn't come, I would not come to this gathering if I thought it was trying to elect a fool like Barack Obama uh, to be president of the United States. If that was what I was here. I wouldn't do it. Okay? Let alone a really, a really wicked person like Hillary Clinton, a faith-based Trump like Hillary Clinton. I wouldn't do it, okay? And if you ask me who I'd vote for tomorrow, it would be Rudy Giuliani. And if you don't like it, you can take a number, get online, and suck my thumb. You were talking about Iranian theocracy and the need to oppose it, but it's one thing to say, you know, it's bad, but what do you, what do you think we do about it? We demolish its uh, nuclear facilities. Air, like we say, we, say, we make it very plain, the day will never dawn when that regime of the Pazderan Revolutionary Guard has nuclear weapons at its disposal. That will never happen. And when they say, what do you mean by that? We say, we just said what we meant. And we can make good on it. Yeah. If that helps to demolish the theocracy as well, all to the good. But for now, our existence is incompatible with nuclear armed theocracy, and can I really not be pushing at an open door saying that in this room? Evidently not. Okay, let's see. Demolish it, and try and bring down the regime at the same time. It's a no-brainer. I'm uh, curious about many things about you. Uh, curious here by the moment with the Rudy Giuliani thing, but I'll limit myself to uh, <clears throat> one of the things in your book you apparently spent uh, quite a bit of time with uh, Rajneesh Bhagwan back in the 80s. Yes. And I'm curious as to, were you there for enlightenment or expose of him, or what was the situation? What were you looking for there? Um, I've had various experiences with um, Eastern religious uh, gurus and godmen, and, um, preachers of the enlightened path. And one of them was with the man Nagon, reincarnated as Osho, if you follow the, uh, the cult press, um, with the same picture of the same flowing robed and flowing bearded man, who was then known as Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Bhagwan basically means God, Sri means holy, Rajneesh was his name. He had a group of orange robed um, rich people in a, an ashram in Pune, near, outside Bombay in India in the 80s. It was a very fashionable resort for American and European wealthy seekers in that period. And he had the largest collection of Rolls Royces then of anyone except uh, President Brezhnev of the Soviet Union. And the BBC paid me to go and pretend to be an acolyte and put on an orange robe and go to this ashram, which is one of the most amusing weeks of my life, actually. Um, it got tiring at times. I mean, it was essentially sex and drugs and rock and roll, and I thought, the BBC is paying for this. Um, <laughs> But there was the spiritual side, too. You had to listen to these bloody, uh, listen to these bloody uh, addresses in the morning. And, and you had to be sniffed on your way in by two very beautiful girls in case you were wearing the wrong kind of aftershave and the pain it brings them and the angst and the anxiety and the questioning and the doubt. That this is actually a very dangerous tendency, I think. It's, it's obvious to me that many of our fellow creatures would rather do without their minds. And they'd rather have reassurance. They'd rather have bliss. They'd, I keep being told, if you only accept nirvana, and that the essence of the all is the Godhead of the true. You know, you'd have happiness and uh, you'd be free from anxiety and stress. And so on. Well, I don't want it. I like anxiety. I like stress. <laughs> I like doubt and argument and these things. If, you, if, if I thought you would give me this, I would hate it. I wouldn't want it. It's an offer not worth having. But one of our antagonists, we have to understand in this argument, is not just the people who farm and exploit credulity 
and so-called spirituality and faith, not just the people who farm it and exploit it, um, but, the, but the people who want it to be true, the people who would rather dwell in the realm of illusion and delusion, many of whom are our fellow citizens. And that's our cultural project, is to try and raise them above the level where charlatanry can poison their lives. Uh, my question <clears throat> is, um, what do you think the consequences will be for here in the United States if we um, leave Iraq um, and the theocrats or whoever take over? Well, we won't let the theocrats take over Iran. I can tell you now, there's too much oil in Iraq for us to let it be controlled by our enemies. This seems to be an axiom. I don't understand why it's so difficult for people to grasp. Actually, I do understand, because apparently oil is a substance almost obscene, like some ghastly bodily secretion that can't be mentioned. Um, I don't feel about that way. I don't feel that way about oil. I think it's a very important economic resource. Uh, we would be hard-pressed without it, as would our allies in Europe and elsewhere. Um, Iraq is a keystone state in the region and a choke point in the world economy. It shouldn't have been ever controlled by a psychopathic crime family had private ownership of oil, and it must never fall into the hands of the parties of God or any other of our enemies. That seems to me obvious. And if people say no blood for oil, moronic thing to say. It's like saying freedom isn't worth fighting for. It's like saying your own interests aren't worth defending. Give up this um, quasi-religious mentality, if you can, while you have time. A fight is actually on in this area, which we dare not lose. We have some brilliant allies there, the secular Kurds, for example, who I don't think anyone in this room would dare say to my face we should betray or abandon, though I, I know most of you are thinking of voting for candidates who would walk away and let them all be killed again without compunction. Well, tell it to me. Look in my eye and say you're willing to do that. The only secular part of the country, the big success that we've created, prosperity, new oil fields, an, an election, no mullahs, an example that could spread to the rest of Iraq. Tell me that, that, that you care so much um, about your own convictions that you're willing to abandon those people. Now would be the chance. So uh, my question is, uh, you suggest that we, we should fight Islam. We should try and limit fundamentalist Islam. That's a serious problem that we have to take. You know, that Actually, we that's not what right. I say. That's not what I said. Oh, I, I said we are that. fighting it. Oh, okay. That's, well, we it is are fighting us. But, uh, so my question is, is how exactly does uh, bombing and killing Muslims lessen their numbers or limit their fervor? Um, I'm just wondering if I should draw you a picture. You mean, how does killing them lessen their number? Your question cannot possibly be as sappy as it sounds. You must have meant something more intelligent than that. Well, my idea is, you, you must have come across this. The numbers phase. of those bombed will decline. Oh, um, <laughs> oh yes, but that encourages others. Well, ah, you're so sure? Yes. Yes, well, I remember being told after 9-11, if we destroy Osama bin Laden, hundreds will spring up in his place. Some of you may have said that. Hope not. You all heard it. Well, in that case, we would find a quick way of surrendering, hadn't we? Had we better not? I mean, there's no point in resisting in that case, because by the more we, the more we beat them, the more strong they'll get. It's like the uh, Greek myth of Antaeus. Every time thrown to the ground, he drew strength from the soil. Unbeatable. If you think, if you think that, by all means, think it. But I don't know what you're doing at a conference that wants to defend atheism against uh, religious barbarism. How do I envision victory, someone asks from the floor. Um, I'll tell you, how, I'll tell you what, uh, how I'd know it was possible. It would come like this. When the side of jihad said, can we take these casualties any longer? When they worried, have we alienated the people as they are worrying now in Iraq? Have we turned everyone off by our tactics? Have we lost friends? Has our reputation gone down? When they ask this, when they say, have we disgraced and discredited ourselves by rape and by video torture and by the killing of uh, other Muslims, they're the ones who are killing Muslims. They're the ones who are blowing up the mosques, not me, not us. They do it and boast of it for, for, the, uh, for the mutilation of women, for the throwing of acid in the faces of girls, for the, for the car bombing of girls' schools. I wonder, I wonder if we've made a mistake by doing this. That's what I want to hear them say. And also, can we take it any longer? 
The Marines come for us by day or night. They shoot us like rats. We bring in volunteers. None of them ever come back. None of them ever go home. They're all killed in Iraq. It's a killing field for us. We, we shove people by the hundreds over the border in open order from a Pakistan into Afghanistan. They're all killed. When do we have to ask ourselves, is God really on our side? That's the point we have to get to. Instead, the sickly, petty masochism of American public opinion saying, shouldn't we hold the flag to half-staff every time one of us gets killed? Shouldn't we be the ones in doubt that we're fighting a just war? Shouldn't we be the ones who are worrying that we have a right on our side? No, no, no. Enough of that. Make them worry. We can get to that point because they are, don't forget, they are suicidal. They are irrational. They operate on a crazy worldview. They will get to the stage where they've realized they've made a mistake. All the evidence is in Iraq already that Al-Qaeda in Iraq has totally isolated and discredited itself, and it's a matter now just of hunting down and killing them, which I think is a pleasure as well as a duty. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, um, Sir. <laughs> that was a curious interruption there. I'm not sure what that was. Uh, I address you as a, an atheist uh, and, 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 a, and a secularist and a Marxist. Um, I'm very much troubled by, by your remarks about the need to stand up and, and, and fight this, this Muslim jihad. I have no time for... Uh, for oppressive religion of, 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 of any stripe. But I, I think uh, you are well aware of the long history of crimes committed by the British government in Iraq, the United States government uh, in Vietnam, and today in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm wondering how you can possibly say that it is Western civilization the civilization of the colonizers and the oppressors, who do it all, of course, in the name of liberation and democracy, uh, how, how this is not the fundamental problem, ra rather than what you call the jihad of, of what I consider to be the response to the, the crimes of, uh, of U.S. and uh, European imperialism. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There you have it. You see how... You see how far the termites have spread and how long and well they've dined. When someone can get up and say that in a meeting of unbelievers, that the problem is Western civilization, not the Islamic threat to it. That's how far the termites have gone. Now, as a matter of fact, sir, I could have asked that question 50 times better than you did and answered it 50 times as comprehensively. If you'd like, I can, without conceit, refer you to a biography of mine by, of Henry Kissinger, that is a compendium and anthology of the war crimes committed uh, by the United States and its allies in the Third World and elsewhere, and a call for those people, those responsible, to be arraigned for crimes against humanity and war crimes. It's a cheap paperback published by the New Left Review that anyone can get hold of, and I can't recommend too highly. One of those crimes, I'll just give you an example to show how utterly fatuous your implication is. One of those crimes was the uh, arming and training of the Indonesian armed forces to take over the, over the Republic of East Timor. Some of you are no doubt aware of this terrible atrocity. Leading, it's one of Noam Chomsky's best campaigns in writing, um, leading to the very near physical extirpation of the people of East Timor. Uh, a genocide more comprehensive than, than Cambodia, taking place a little afterwards with our weapons, with our diplomatic protection, and with the endorsement of Kissinger and Ford. Hands up those who roughly remember this. Okay, not as good as I'd have liked, but still, and sad, but, but, but bear it in mind and look it up. Now, what are, what are some of the items of the Al-Qaeda bin Laden manifesto? Well, oddly enough, and this was to my surprise, I thought it would be lower down, item three in the charge against the West is that it reversed course on East Timor, tried to undo the genocide, uh, brought East Timor to a referendum on independence, sent Jose uh, Vera de Mielo, one of the greatest um, 
Uh, sorry, Sergio Vieira de Mello, one of the greatest UN civil servants, to East Timor to supervise the transition to independence and the election, and made East Timor the newest member of the UN. Bin Laden says, for this we will never forgive the Christian crusaders and their imperialist friends. They took away a republic from a Muslim land, Indonesia. Most of the people of East Timor, by the way, are, are Christian and speak Portuguese. Um, a detail. Uh, for this, we will never forgive them. For this, they, that was the reason they gave for blowing up the UN office in Iraq, because that's where Melia was sent next, with a truck bomb of explosives so enormous that it must have been borrowed from the former Iraqi army and Ba'ath Party. That's the reason they gave for blowing up the Australian tourists in Bali, in Indonesia, and the um, Indonesian taxi drivers who were servicing that resort, because they couldn't forgive the West for its behavior in East Timor. In other words, if you want to avoid upsetting these people, you have to let Indonesia commit genocide in East Timor. Otherwise, they'll be upset with you. You'll have made an enemy. If you tell them they can't throw acid in the faces of unveiled women in Karachi, they will be annoyed with you. If you say, we insist, we, uh, we think that c cartoonists in Copenhagen can print satire on the Prophet Muhammad, you've just made an enemy. You've brought it on. You're, you're, you're encouraging it to happen. So unless you're willing to commit suicide for yourself and for this culture, get used to the compromises you'll have to make and the eventual capitulation that will come to you. But bloody well don't do that in my name because I'm not doing it. You surrender in your own name, leave me out of it. I'm going to fight these people and every other theocrat all the way. All the way. For free expression, for free expression, for women's rights, for self-determination of small peoples, for the right of Iraqis to federate and have their own show, for the right of the Lebanese not to be bullied by Hezbollah and to have a multicultural democracy. Yes, I'll fight for this, and I think that the 82nd Airborne is brave to be fighting for it too. And I think you should be ashamed sneering at people who guard you while you sleep. Thanks.